pay a dollar a day to pay the bus fare for their long-distance commute. To help the students get the jobs, the ROP program trains them in how to fill out a job application, how to handle a job interview, how to dress to impress employers. Beyond the money they earn, the students say the program helps them raise their sights beyond their own inner city neighborhoods. A lot of my peers out there, they, a lot of them don't really have the incentive to go get a job, so it kind of like pull everyone else down and you have to really be strong to be able to break out from everybody else. Yes, I recommend it. It's a pretty good place to work. Yes, you get a lot of um, experience, you know, working with people. How are you going to use the money that you earn this summer? I'm going to save it later on, maybe for my college. The summer busing program has worked so well, school officials hope to expand it. They say students on the job learn lessons about pride and self-esteem that simply cannot be taught in the classroom. Chuck Condor, CNN, Los Angeles. As the House Ethics Committee begins its investigation of Speaker Jim Wright, Washington insiders are asking how much of the probe is substance and how much is political. Candy Crowley reports. If Attorney General Ed Meese were not under investigation for alleged unethical behavior, if Reagan intimate Mike Deaver had not been convicted of perjury, if former Reaganite Lynn Noxinger had not been convicted for ethical violations, would House Speaker Jim Wright now be the subject of a preliminary House investigation into some of his activities? A lot of Wright supporters say no, and some experts agree. Of the six charges, none of them are new. Some of them are very old. Some of them are more than, I don't know, almost eight or nine years old. And for these all to be dredged up at a time that a report is about to be issued, criticizing, if not talking about, the terrible conduct of Attorney General Meese um, in the middle of a hotly contested presidential year is a little bit too coincidental. Jim Wright's problems and some of these allegations uh, were caused by behavior a long time ago. This is not anything that's just cropped up. Meese, Deaver, Nossinger, and others who left the Reagan administration under cloudy circumstances are known collectively as the sleaze factor a political albatross for George Bush, who is unable to stray too far from the Reagan administration. The right charges have now begun to crop up in Bush's campaign speeches. Almost gleeful about Wright's predicament is Republican Party Chairman Frank Ferenkopf, who says the charges gave Republicans a level playing field. If the Democrats are going to raise some kind of sleaze factor, they've got to realize that people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. On the Democratic side, presidential hopeful Mike Dukakis praises the speaker for his willingness to cooperate. A sharp contrast, he says, to the way the administration handled its problems. The political angle is even more acute given the fact that the probe will probably hang over Wright through next month's Democratic convention, which Wright will chair. Wright, who admits to judgment errors during his 34 years in office, is taking none of this lying down. Friday, he issued a 23-page defense during a lengthy news conference. Sunday, he'll take his case to a larger audience, appearing on two network news shows. Candy Crowley for CNN, Washington. The latest reports from American television. Sports news now. First, football. And England's team manager, Bobby Robson, has delayed in naming his side for this afternoon's game against Ireland. It seems striker Gary Lineker is fit to play, but the big doubt is over central defender Mark Wright. In yesterday's Group 1 game, Spain beat Denmark 3-2. The injury problems have been growing for Bobby Robson. He couldn't duck the issue any longer. Centre-half Dave Watson's definitely out, and there were serious doubts over his partner Mark Wright, who has hamstring trouble. While the rest of the squad limbered up before a secret training session at the Neckar Stadium, Wright was gently put through his paces by the team physiotherapist, closely watched by the manager. Wright has made strides, uh, is very much improved, um, but needs another day. He has a chance, but it's, uh, I wouldn't know what the percentage is. I'm very hopeful at the minute. Um... As you said, I did some training this morning and I didn't, haven't got had any reaction from it. Racing and at York, Pat Eddery celebrated his, his return from a four-day suspension with a double on Weldmays and Cadeau Généraux. It was a successful afternoon too for the Princess Royal, who guided Insula, a 14-to-1 outsider, to a 12-length victory. It was the Princess's third win on the flat and she got a big reception from the crowd as she rode into the winner's enclosure. 
Tennis and Boris Becker and Stefan Edberg will meet in the final of the Stella Artois tournament in London today. Yesterday, Becker beat Australia's Darren Carhill, while Edberg overcame the Frenchman Guy Forget. Cricket and the TCCB has warned Mike Gatting he could face further disciplinary action if the chapter on Pakistan in his book isn't removed. Although Gatting has asked them to, the publishers haven't yet agreed. Ian Botham began his progress back to health and cricket when he left hospital in Worcester yesterday after a back operation. He has to stay at home for a month, then have intensive physiotherapy. He won't play until next season. And now a final look at the main news this morning. Neil Kinnock has hit back at Labour left-wingers who want to remove him and Roy Hattersley from the party leadership. In a keynote speech at County Durham, Mr Kinnock signalled his determination to bring in new policies. He said he'd face any critic, any adversary and any contender. Peter Allen reports. Neil Kinnock arrived in a vehicle of the past with a vision of the future and savaged his critics as people who were trying to call back yesterday. The point is about yesterday is yesterday is dead, yesterday is gone, yesterday isn't coming back, people don't live yesterday. He's clearly decided to make this autumn's leadership election a vote of confidence not just in him, but in those new policies. In Chesterfield, Tony Benn, candidate for his job, told a gathering of about 2,000 left-wingers that confusion over nuclear policy had to end. There are certain problems in that statement, but I have no reason to believe, as the Transport and General Workers' Union vote, suggested that the Labour conference will want to go back on a policy it's developed over 20 years, uh, which in my opinion has been justified by events. And even if the result of his contest with Mr Kinnock seems a lost cause, on nuclear weapons Mr Benn seems to have a fighting chance of success. The streets of Stuttgart are quiet this morning after clashes between police and drunk English soccer fans. Last night, police reported running battles around the central shopping area and other parts of the city. They charged 200 fans who retaliated by throwing bottles. Earlier, the atmosphere had been friendly. The British Embassy says it's been told of 10 arrests. The fans will be held in custody till after today's game. In the Gulf, a British-flagged supertanker was set ablaze after being attacked by Iranian gunboats. The SO Demisha was hit off the Saudi Arabian port of Ras Tanura. A crew member made radio contact with a British warship patrolling nearby. They fired approximately eight or nine. We don't know whether it was rockets or shells out of Dover. Roger, do you have any casualties, over? Negative, negative. It's been revealed that Vasily Shipilov, the Russian released after spending 36 years in Soviet prisons, was not a religious dissident, but a vagrant who'd violated work contracts. The Birmingham vicar who'd campaigned 10 years for his release says he's embarrassed but pleased he's been freed. Reverend Dick Rogers locked himself in a cage earlier this year to highlight Shipilov's plight. A 10-hour pop concert to celebrate the 70th birthday of jailed black South African nationalist Nelson Mandela has ended with a spectacular finale. It's estimated that 400 million people all over the world saw the concert, which included many top international rock stars. Lloyd Bracey reports. Fireworks in the night sky over Wembley mark the end of this controversial concert. The football stadium was packed with 72,000 people who'd come to hear a galaxy of rock stars perform a birthday tribute to a man none of them has seen. The singer Sting started it all more than 10 hours earlier, followed by a parade of international artists, all hoping to bring pressure on the South African government to free Mandela from jail before his 70th birthday next month. Some of Stevie Wonder's equipment was stolen, putting his set in doubt, but it turned up later and he performed as planned. Guitarist Eric Clapton joined a specially reformed Dire Straits to bring the marathon to a close. Meanwhile, in South Africa, where the concert wasn't seen on television, Mandela's wife Winnie told him about it, while even his countrymen who don't support him were holding their own birthday tribute. About 400 people attended the funeral of Russell Harty at his home village in the Yorkshire Dales. Family and close friends followed the funeral cortege through the village of Giggleswick. Among them was playwright Alan Bennett, a friend for many years, 
and past and present stars of Coronation Street. The Queen took part in the traditional Trooping of the Colour ceremony as part of her official birthday celebrations. This was just the second time the Queen had attended the Trooping without her famous war horse, Burmese. The ceremony is more than 200 years old, but it's only since the middle of the last century that the monarch has always attended it. And that's all from today's morning news. Join us again at the same time tomorrow. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye and good morning.